And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. My sister Kim is also an ordained PCUSA pastor, and she told me a story recently about the time she was serving as one of the pastors of Central Presbyterian Church in downtown Atlanta, back in the 1990s. That church has a vibrant outreach ministry with people on the margins, the homeless, those facing the challenges of living in neighborhoods of poverty, the community center housed in the church to provide financial, food, and housing assistance to those in need of those services sees dozens of people every day. They had a social worker on their staff, their version of our own Evelyn Puckett, as well as other administrative and pastoral staff that helped with those vital ministries. There was a week one fall when they found themselves short-staffed unexpectedly. There was a man named David who had been a longtime guest of the community center who would sometimes come for assistance of one kind or another, but who also came often just to help out. Everyone was crazy about him. David was kind, compassionate, and helpful. So when this staffing shortage occurred, they decided to ask David to help out in the center and to pay him by the hour for the work he would do. He came and worked all week and was very helpful. And toward the end of the week, they discovered that David had stolen several checks from the assistance checkbook and had been cashing them all over town. At the end of the week, my sister was going to lunch on a crisp fall day with a social worker of the center, and as they stood on a street corner waiting for the light to change, Kim turned to her and said, I just don't understand it. David has always been so nice. We have helped him so many times. We have known him for so long and trusted him. I just don't get it. I thought David was a good guy. She said the social worker turned and smiled and look at her, looked at her with a very peaceful expression on her face and said, Kim, David is a good guy. He also happens to be a thief. My sister said she had never forgotten that lesson about the reality of human beings and of the world we live in. We are all living every moment with goodness and faithfulness side by side with sin, evil, and brokenness. Life is a mixture of sin and righteousness, of evil and good, and so is each one of us. In the parable of the wheat and the weeds, or the wheat and the tares, as some of us have known it most of our lives, Jesus tells a story about a good crop of wheat growing alongside a crop of weeds in the same field. The good seed for the wheat was sown by the landowner. The bad seed of the weeds was sown in the dark of night while everyone else slept by an enemy. And now they were growing side by side. Now here is a little Middle Eastern botany lesson for you. I'm sure you've been dying to know. The particular word for weeds used here in the Greek is zizanian, which is a very particular kind of weed known as the bearded darnel. Darnell is prolific all over Israel and the surrounding region to this day, and it looks exactly like wheat as it is growing. Even the most experienced farmer cannot tell the difference until the two plants are fully mature, when it becomes clear that one is a weed and one is true wheat. In fact, a common nickname for bearded Darnell is false wheat. Here is the catch. By the time you can tell the Darnell from the wheat, they have grown side by side for so long that the invasive Darnell's roots become hopelessly entwined with the roots of the good wheat. So pulling the Darnell up would also uproot the wheat. That is why the landowner tells his servants to just be patient, to let them grow together until both are harvested and then the toxic Darnell could be separated out from the good wheat and burned away. 
It is an odd story indeed, and it is a story for our ears with a twist. The imagery would have been familiar to the crowds who had gathered to hear Jesus teach that day on the shores of the lake, as agriculture was the predominant way of life at the time. But what does it mean exactly, this admonition from Jesus to allow the wheat and the weeds to grow together until the harvest? This talk of an enemy that comes in the night and sows bad seed among the good. What does it mean for Jesus to encourage a long, steady, slow, patient waiting for all to be revealed at the harvest to come? What is this parable trying to tell us in our own day and age? Well, let's dig in a bit. I think there are a few very important lessons Jesus is teaching us with this parable. First, this parable tells us a basic truth about the world and about our lives. Evil and sin are real. They are strong forces that live right alongside the forces of goodness, kindness, compassion, righteousness, and faithfulness. The world and every human being in it are a mixture of both of these forces that exist side by side. One question this parable seeks to answer then and now is an age-old one. If God is all good and all powerful, if Christ has already come to defeat sin and evil, then why is there still so much evil in the world? Why are we still so frustratingly subject to sin? This parable tells us a couple of things about those questions. One is that God sows us, those God has called to be his people, his children, those whom Christ has claimed as his own, God sows us and plants us in the world. We are not meant to be removed from the world in some safe and pristine place. We are planted smack dab in the middle of the world. And if there is one thing we know, it is that our world is still filled with brokenness, sin, pain, suffering, and evil, just as it is filled with goodness and kindness and compassion and justice and love. There are forces at work in the world and in each one of our lives, and yes, even in the church, that are contrary to the will and the purposes of God. And we live our lives in the midst of those destructive forces, just as we live our lives in the midst of God's grace, mercy, justice, peace, joy, and love. God's redemptive force at work in Jesus and in the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Both are present side by side in the world, in our own lives, and sometimes even in the church. You see, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus talks a great deal about the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom. And Jesus tells us that the kingdom is already here. It is among us and within us even now as we sit in these pews this morning. But we live in a tension between the already and the not yet. The kingdom is already here. Jesus inaugurated the kingdom and calls us as his disciples to be a part of the nurturing and the building up of that kingdom every single day. But the kingdom, though here, is not yet realized in all of its fullness. That will only happen, scripture tells us, when Jesus comes again in glory and the kingdom is finally and forever fulfilled. Already? Not yet. And in this in-between time that we live, sin and righteousness live side by side, faithfulness and doubt, good and evil. So where does this evil among us, this sin within us, where does it come from? In this parable, Jesus says that the enemy came at night when everyone was asleep and sowed the bad seed. The landowner did not sow the seed. An enemy sowed the seed. 
and the lesson here is clear. We are in a world that calls us as faithful people, those who are striving to be faithful, to live always with an attitude of vigilance against the sins within us, the temptations around us, and the evil we see in some of the systemic, pervasive forces at work in the world that seek to divide us, to wreak havoc and destruction, and the forces that are counter to God's purposes of redemption, salvation, and transformed life. Our natural tendency to the impulse is similar to the impulse of the servants in the parable in the face of the reality of the weeds growing among the wheat. We want to pull up the weeds, to tear them out and to cast them away in order to purify the wheat field. Here is where the, the parable for us takes a surprising turn. The landowner says, no, let them grow together until the time of harvest. The landowner seems prepared to have a long suffering patience and he indicates that it can be difficult sometimes to tell the wheat from the weeds and that it will be up to the landowner's reapers to judge the good from the bad at the time of the harvest. There are at least two lessons. One lesson is that the weeds and the wheat are so intertwined that you cannot destroy one without destroying the other. So the landowner gives both time to grow. Both receive sunlight, rain, fertilizer, attention, and care from the landowner. Both are allowed to develop to their full potential. You cannot always judge, the landowner seems to say, which plant will be fruitful and which will not. Sometimes what looks like a weed may actually bear good fruit, and sometimes what looks like good wheat may only be a toxic weed. We live in an age, you and I, when we want to make quick judgments about people, don't we? We like for things to be clear cut. You are either good or you are bad. And if you are bad, you are not worthy of time. You are not worthy of continued efforts at redemption. We all know this tendency among us in our modern world. It is true in our political lives when each side of the aisle judges the other side of the aisle as evil, not worthy of consideration or time, and wholly bad. We certainly see it in the world of the internet and social media where a person makes one mistake, sometimes a big one, and we cancel them forever and consider them unworthy of redemption. People can say or do the wrong thing and suddenly armchair warriors behind their screens are seeking to have them fired from their jobs, ruin their reputations, go after their families, and those armchair warriors feel righteous in their crusade of judgment. And lest we think the church is free of this kind of judgment, we all have known times in the church at large in the world, and even in this beloved church, when we have judged one another based on our differences in theological positions, biblical interpretations, stands on issues of the day, and we have decided someone is unworthy of our time, our care, our love because of these differences. And we believe that the other who thinks differently than we ought to be judged and cast out. Churches argue and split over such issues all the time. And usually there is this kind of harsh judgment of one another at the bottom of those splits. But the truth this parable suggests is much more complicated than any of those scenarios would suggest. Every single one of us is a mixture of wheat and weeds, aren't we? I know that every single day I have thoughts that are unkind or biased. I say words I wish I could take back. I do things I know are not in keeping with being a faithful citizen of God's kingdom. 
or I refrain from doing things that would build up God's kingdom out of fear or laziness or concern about what others might think of me. In every single one of us, the roots of our sinfulness and the roots of our belovedness as a follower of Jesus are so intertwined, it is almost impossible to untangle them. I know that there are times when people must look at me and do not see one who is acting as fruitful wheat in the world. There are times when I look at others and judge that they are not living in faithful, fruitful ways. But this parable calls us to a long, steadfast patience with one another. This parable reminds us that we cannot always discern what is fruitful and what is not at first glance. This parable reminds us that just as we depend on the gracious patience of God and Christ with our sinfulness, we need to extend the same gracious patience to one another. This parable reminds us that it is not our place to judge. God is the only one who can truly judge. Now this patience is not a passive one. Matthew is also the gospel writer, after all, who records Jesus teaching us that we are called to be salt and light in the world, that we are called while we live here to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to visit the prisoner, to clothe the naked, to give shelter to the homeless, to give comfort to the sick and the grieving. We are side by side with the evil pain and brokenness of the world, and we know that the world and each one of us is a mixture of sin and faithfulness, but we are called as followers of Jesus Christ to nurture the good within us and in the world each and every day in whatever way we can. Because we receive grace from God in Christ, we are called to offer that grace to one another even as we seek to be more faithful each day in our words and in our actions to do all we can to build up the kingdom of God as we await its final consummation. I don't know how many of you jumped on the bandwagon of watching the streaming series Ted Lasso on Apple Plus TV. The series debuted about the same time COVID hit and sent us into quarantine. We were desperate for community as we sat isolated in our homes, and this sweet show about an American football coach and his longtime friend and assistant coach who were hired to go to England as the coaches of an English soccer team about which they knew nothing seemed to resonate with so many of us. Coach Ted Lasso and assistant coach Beard were out of their element entirely. Many of us tuned in week after week for three seasons to cheer on this kind, sweet, simple coach as he managed to build a winning team against all odds. The villain over the last couple of seasons was a man named Nate who had betrayed Ted and the team badly. He had said awful things and done awful things. In the penultimate episode of the series, Ted is ready to give Nate a second chance, but Coach Beard is still angry and does not want to forgive. So in one pivotal scene, Ted says to Coach Beard, you know, Coach, I hope either all of us or none of us are judged by our weakest moments, but rather by the strength we show when and if we are ever given a second chance. Coach Beard then grudgingly, in a way, goes to see Nate and he tells him his own story. Coach Beard and Ted, it seems, met in college as backup players on the football team and they became friends. When they graduated, they went their separate ways. Ted married and became a coach and Beard fell into drug use and went to prison. When he got out of prison, Coach Beard reached out to Ted Lasso, who took him in, fed him, and gave him a place to stay in his home. In return, Beard stole Ted's car. He was arrested and would have gone back to prison, 
except for one thing. Ted went to the police station and told the police that he had loaned Coach Beard his car. Then he forgave Beard, took him back in, gave him a job, and saved his life. Then Beard says to Nate, so to honor him, I forgive you, and I offer you your job back. The life part is up to you. In part, this parable tells us of a God who is steadfast in his patience with us, nurturing us with grace and love and working redemption within us and among us. We are all a mixture of wheat and weeds, and God is always trying to help us bear fruit more than we spread toxins. Of course, the parable also tells us that there will come a day of judgment when God will finally see everything in us, in the church, and in the world in God's balance. And God will separate those things that are stumbling blocks, all the causes of sin, and will purge those things in a fire, a refiner's fire. And presumably, we will be burned some as well, but we will come out of the fire burnished and shining, fit for God's eternal kingdom. Now there may be some that God will deem as evildoers and cast them away entirely. It's a mystery and only God can judge. Only God knows. But I do believe that our God, who sent Jesus to live among us, to teach us, to heal us, to forgive us, to die for us, will continue to give us every chance to bear fruit, will continue to burn away all that is sinful in us in a refiner's fire, will seek until our last breath, and friends, maybe even beyond our last breath, when we stand finally in his presence, to give us not only a second chance, but a third and a fourth and a fifth and on into eternity to come home to him. After all, Jesus forgave those who hung him on a cross. He entrusted his gospel and his church to those who had denied him and abandoned him. He knew the church would be full of messy, sinful people, and that sometimes we would make a mess of the church and of our lives and of the world. But he still calls us into the church, welcomes us in the waters of baptism, feeds us at the table of the Lord's Supper, and forgives us over and over again, and promises us redemption and resurrection to new life. And this parable promises us that in the end, God will finally have his way, that God will judge us and the world, and refine us and the world until we can shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. As we will sing in our closing hymn in the last verse, finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Until that day, we and the world and the church are a jumble of wheat and weeds, all intertwined together. By God's grace in Jesus Christ, we are loved anyway, called to be light and salt, to do unto the least of these as God has done to us, to love each other as we have first been loved in Christ. The end of it all is a mystery that rests in God's gracious hands. But in Christ, we are assured that God will do whatever it takes to make us shine like the sun when the kingdom of our Father finally comes in all of its fullness. Thanks be to God for his amazing grace. Amen.